I think it's so about owning who you are entirely and, and dating yourself, which can be hard. Welcome to The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. As a leading manifestation advisor with a process that's, well, radically different from the old New Age model, mine is rooted in psychology, neuroscience, and my energetic gifts. I created this podcast to help you expand your subconscious limiting beliefs about the potential of deserving the manifestations you're calling in. Therefore, you're tuning into this podcast series to show your subconscious that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, you've already started the process of manifesting it. If you enjoy this episode, please leave us our review comment, and share it with your fellow manifester that's struggling or could really benefit from the information that you're about to learn. Welcome back to the Expanded Podcast. So today we're doing a really fun episode because it's our year anniversary since we launched. And what do we have lately? How many downloads now? Probably closer to 2 million now. So we have to thank you guys so much because without you, we wouldn't even be there. And the fact that you're sharing with your friends and your community, your family, mm -hmm. we're just so floored by that. So for this episode, we kind of wanted to reintroduce ourselves. And you guys have noticed Lila has really been a part of the podcast and <laughs> she's going to become far more of it because she's going to actually start doing some episodes herself, which I think you guys will find very expansive because she gets to come at it more in layman's terms rather than me who's tried most of the systems you're learning about. Lila gets to start from the beginning with <laughs> you. So you'll extract a lot more information. So today's episode, we're up at the retreat house. You might hear some birds chirping, maybe light construction. <laughs> <laughs> we're outside. It's a really nice day. It's beautiful. <laughs> we both went to separate watering holes yesterday. Mm -hmm. I went to the river. And, and I went to Hornet's Nest, which you'll see on the, the Forest House guide. Yeah. And you can actually check out the links below. We'll have the site and you can get a feel for it. So if you and your fellow friends come up or maybe you have a podcast mm -hmm. and you bring up people and record them here, it'll be really, really special. And I do advise for the people who are interested in the water bit to come and visit before November to enjoy the river. Cold. <laughs> yeah, too cold and the water runs out. Oh, yeah. That's and the snow point. begins. All right. So today we, we're doing an Ask Us Anything to reintroduce ourselves to all of the new listeners. Mm -hmm. And so we put out on Instagram, if you don't follow us already, you're going to want to, to be able to ask questions in the future. And so these are all of your questions for Lila and I. Lila, I'll let you kick off the first question. Sure. So some of these questions might be a little bit random, but I think it's fun to listen to hear these things about us perhaps so we'll start with how many hours of sleep do you get <laughs> oh man I'm one of those projectors who needs a lot of rest and mm -hmm. I look at my friends that are manifesting generators and generators and it seems like you guys can do whatever if I don't get and I only sleep seven hours I wish I my body would do the clock of eight yeah. but I only sleep seven I try to go to bed if I can when the sun's setting you know especially in the summer so 9 p.m mm -hmm. it's it's really good because I suffered from a lot of endocrine issues, such as adrenal issues. And one of the key factors to healing that is to make sure you're in bed before 10. So I really try for that. However, lately, it's been getting later and later just because it's been crazy during this eclipse season, I yeah, feel. A lot of energy flowing around. Oh my gosh, with that full moon. But I do try for seven hours and before nine, if I can, before 10, certainly, if I can. What mm -hmm. about you, Lila? I I like to go to bed on the earlier side, but normally that ends up being closer to like 11, which really isn't early. But I do, and I wake up naturally very early, usually around 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I cannot sleep in regardless of when I go to bed, which I do, I am more of a morning person and a night owl as well, which is kind of odd. But 
I love having an early morning. I feel like I have like an extra few hours of the day and I feel more on top of things, but it is hard when I find myself going to bed at like 11 or 12 because usually I get like a spark of creative energy when the sun goes down. But I do try to get around. I mean, I hope to have eight hours a night, but it tends to be a little bit less as well. Yeah. And I think that was something that Jenna did say. Manifesting generators are late to bed, early to yes. wake, right? That's a thing. Yes, it is a days. thing. And so. it's a hundred percent true. So for you <laughs> MGs out there, I'm so happy I'm not you. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard. I cannot sleep in for the life of me and I can't take naps. Oh, wow. So, I can do those. Yeah. I cannot nap. My favorite on a biomat. I, it I sounds have like heaven. <laughs> I have this new thing, which is actually tremendously helpful for anybody who's doing the workshops and the DIs to help you sink in deeper, quicker. When I was getting my teeth extracted at Dr. Nunnally in Texas, for those of you that are interested in what I'm talking about, he's the best biological dentist Mm -hmm. in the country. And you can listen to the episode with Nadine Artemis, where we go fully into depth about the teeth and everything holistic. It's, It's an incredible episode. But what they taught me in the recovery, they have this really tremendous recovery what do you, protocol where while they're extracting your teeth, they do an IV vitamin C drip, and then they use your own blood to create platelets to put in the extractions to heal much quicker. And then they do this process where they do, I want to say it's kind of like cranial sacral, but not. So right after you leave, they put you in this like warm bed and they prop you up and they put pillows underneath your knees so that your heels are in float. And as soon as you do that, so if your neck is propped and the pillows are beneath your knees, you're in float, you go automatically into parasympathetic nervous system, which is, I had no idea. I had no idea either. So automatically your stomach will start growling, which, you know, triggers to tell you you're in it because that's when your digestion can start to work again. Mm -hmm. You're not in fight or flight anymore. So your organs pick up and start working. So now before a DI, I'll turn on my bio mat, which up at the house, there's a travel size in every room yep. and I lie on it and then I prop my knees up and I prop my shoulders up and I go right away into parasympathetic wow. and I, yeah. So for the, the people who have trouble napping out there and napping is an option, that's something worth trying is wow. propping, suspending try your that. heels and making sure your lower that's back so is supported. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay. This question's for you, Lila. What was the motivation behind trying to manifest a famous partner? And do you want to give backstory for the new listeners? Oh, sure. Where you're at today, if that's even a thing. Sure. I'll give a little backstory. So I kind of, I guess the idea came to me that, you know, I was feeling really empowered by my manifestation process and watching things come to me and feeling, learning my authentic code and just coming a little bit more into myself. And I thought it was kind of a two part. One, it was sort of an experiment, like, can I manifest a famous partner? And then on the other hand, it was also, you know, I, I realized and I, I do recognize now that it was more of a mirror as to what I I desire to be or what I hope, want to become more of, which is I just in my head, I label famous as like charismatic and successful and, you know, has a lot of friends, which I know is not true for <laughs> I know. Uh, it's more of like, I don't know if you've met Macaulay yeah. Culkin, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know it was definitely, it was, it was made up in my mind, but I realized, and because that was, that's like a major thing that I look for in, in a partner is someone who's just like really social and friendly and charismatic and successful and creative. But that was sort of what I, I saw. And I realized it's because it's something that I feel I am naturally, but I hide because of a lot of other shadows and whatnot. And so I decided that I wanted to someone manifest <laughs> a famous boyfriend and see if I can have that LA experience. And it, yeah, mostly it was kind of an experiment. So I did have a few things come through and, but nothing really solid. But so yeah, that was my motivation behind it. And it really, it just more exactly was a mirror to show me what I wanted to be more of. Not that I wanted to be famous, but I wanted to be more outgoing, um, more creative, more successful. And now I've kind of put it on the back burner, not to disappoint, <laughs> but instead of that, you know, that label being a thing, I'm kind of letting things naturally come and figuring out more and more like 
why I want a certain trait in someone. And, but it is still a fun experiment. And I've, I have gotten a tiny bit close to like C listers, <laughs> which has been fun, but we'll see. I still think it would be a fun LA experience. I want to touch on one thing that you said that I think is really important for people. And I'll give an example of this. When you're going through the How to Manifest workshop, formally Formula Magnetism, it's so funny. I ha- and actually, you guys all know her. You can listen to this episode, Amanda Blair. She is a relationship coach. And she was a client of mine, a very early client. And she had been wanting to manifest a British guy. <laughs> and when we took this workshop, you know, I talk about in that workshop how to manifest, that it's so important to get down to your core essence wants. And mm-hmm. when we broke down the British thing, I think she had associated British guys with red hair and great sense of yeah. humor. <laughs> so it was like, well, put that on your right, list. Exactly, exactly. So that's cool that you're finding the core essence yeah. beneath your list, that it's not technically a famous person, right. but it's those elements. Right. So I think that's good for anybody who is crafting their list mm-hmm. to know. How have you grown your business as a projector? Well, (laughs) I would say the first couple of years, I certainly wasn't living my design whatsoever. I was working 14 to 16 hours a day Mm -hmm. doing everything. And I think that that massively, then I started taking clients, which then became, I mean, because I leave my body when I channel it. I think that's what really threw me over for the endocrine issues Mm -hmm. really threw me over for getting sick way too much and my body totally Mm -hmm. suffered from it and then lila was the first person we hired which i still have the manifestation list of calling in lila and after that then we started to just continue hiring a team Mm -hmm. and sort of the goal this year is to get into a place where i can really get into my feminine and really focus on you know becoming a mother may it be biological or adoptive But I wasn't living my design and throughout durations of having the team all together, I've been trying to step more and more and more and more into my design. But yeah, I just worked my ass off in the beginning, didn't sleep a lot, like got very sick. (laughs) I know another question we ended up having too was how did you get your first client as a projector? The way I went about it is I was actually really, really shadowy and resistant to releasing my gifts into Mm -hmm. the world, especially coming from a small conservative town with like a a cowboy dad. I was worried what people would think of me. So the universe actually forced me because it dried up all of my resources and I kept getting him in meditation. You need to put this into the world. So the way that I did it, the way that I kind of allowed invitations to come was I made a blog post. I put it up on the blog and I said, I'm doing, I'm a manifestation advisor I'm do at the time I called my manifestation Mm -hmm. guide. I'm doing sessions if anybody's interested. And therefore I then started to just educate on manifestation. You know, I would do a post a week about how this is different than the law of attraction. How this is different (laughs) than the secret. And from there I started to get the invites. People would reach out for sessions. Oh wow. Yeah. Let's do this one for fun. I know a lot of people are really curious about this from, from, I get this a lot in the comments, but I think everybody can benefit because we have different skin types. Sure. What is your skincare routine, Lila? Sure. So this has been somewhat of a journey for me because I, growing up, was really lucky with good skin and I never even really washed my face and I was like didn't understand I didn't know a single thing about skincare and I would just kind of use I started using I might be pronouncing it wrong but I think it's Andalou or Andalou I don't even know I'll that. tag what I'm trying to say okay because I don't I'm, I might <laughs> is be it wrong. green and clean it's it's clean it's from I would get it at Whole Foods and it comes, there's like a few different colors and each color is like for a different thing. So there's, there's like, yeah, there's cleanse and tighten and stuff like that. But anyways, I started using that as a cream at night. And I, I mean, I still, it just feels so silky smooth on your face. <laughs> but then once I got the IUD and I moved to LA and my skin started really acting out, that's when I sort of started a bit of a journey to figure out what was best for my skin and how to heal the acne that was that was coming up and really I found you know it sounds so corny but it does come a lot from the inside out (laughs) first of all so I you know started drinking really clean water and that cleared it up a bit and then I did get my IUD out so then I was able to kind of see what my skin is like naturally and then treat it so now what I do is I use it's a clean face wash 
I'm going to have to tag it below. It starts with a C. In the show notes, we'll put Lila's skincare yeah, routine. Yeah, exactly. Because obviously I just don't pay attention. But yeah, it's really clean. It's it's a really gentle cleanser. And then sometimes I'll use a, I really like the this brand called Tulia. They make um uh, this exfoliant face mask. So I like to use that. Or the Evan Healy um, green tea face mask. I really matcha like one, matcha think, green right? tea. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that really brightens my skin. And then I've just been using, I've gone through a few different kinds of moisturizers and face creams and I was using some face oils and with essential oils in them. And for some reason, I don't know if it was a mix of the essential oil or what was happening, but it was making my skin super dry. So I went back to using um, a cream, which was my Andalou cream. And then, but recently I started using the um, Living Libations Rose. Oh so good and it's I don't know how that differs from the other oils I was using but it's totally changed my face so now I literally just wash it and put that on and that's it honestly and I guess I'll go into mine with that living libations again I'm just going to plug that episode it was from early on with Nadine Artemis you'll understand why the products are so Mm -hmm. bananas but they are the cleanest purest most condensed (laughs) (laughs) essential oil products and I hadn't really tried them much until who introduced me to them I was introduced to a product and I think it was best skin ever and I began to use it for cleansing I was oil cleansing with Mm -hmm. it and then just using it after and my skin started to dramatically change so for me I only use three brands and that's Evan Healy Again, you know, I used them for years and years and then Mm -hmm. we happened to get in touch with them and they did a whole presentation for the brand last Mm -hmm. year. And I was like, holy shit, this is an incredible company. No wonder I used it for years. Yeah. So I use only Evan Healy Living Libations and now a company called BioEssence. And that has a phyto retinol. So it's not the traditional chemical retinol, but it's actually from plants. And it's so much like more sensitive Mm -hmm. on the skin than proper retinol is I find so every woman and men I've man I've ever spoken to who has aged phenomenally every one of them you ask them what they've done and they've all been using retin-a or retinol that's what I've noticed yeah every one of them (laughs) I'm gonna add that to my skincare routine (laughs) so I was so happy to finally find a plant-based one you know that's gentle but does the same it has the same effect effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So my skincare routine, it varies sometimes, but it goes like this. I cleanse my face with the Evan Healy Milk Cleanser. I should also worth, it's worth mentioning that I'm a dry, I'm normal to dry. So I use that. And then after I cleanse, I'll use the Evan Healy Rose Geranium uh, Toner or whatever you call it. I think it's hydrosol. And I pat that into my face. She showed us that. (laughs) So it's like you very gently hold your hands on your face like sinking it into the pores Mm -hmm. more and then after that every single night this isn't I've talked about this in a podcast intro I used their rose hip serum and she told us during that presentation that I think she was roughly in her mid 40s I want to say late 30s to mid 40s and she had been using it every single day for 12 years and doesn't have one sunspot on her face yeah and she explained that it breaks up the the Mm -hmm. pigmentation of hyperpigmentation and, and evens out your skin texture. And I realized, I think about a month ago, I've been using it every single night since that time in December. And most of mine is gone. And areas and patches have relieved. New ones wow. have sort of come back. Mm-hmm. So I use it every single night um, so that I use it daily So because I'm very prone to skin sunspots. Mm-hmm. So that's something I use every night. And then I literally use the Evan Healy Shea Butter Chapstick on my <laughs> lips because the skin's the same apparently around your lips as well as your eyes. Oh, wow. So I put it on my eyes as well. And so that's what I do every evening. However, I do every other night after I cleanse, I pat my face fully dry and I use the BioEssence Phyto Retinol. So it's one day on, one day off. And then for my morning routine, I don't cleanse my face. I just wash it in the shower. I just use water. And then when I get out, I use the Evan Healy Rose Geranium. And then I use the Living Libations Soothsayer Serum. It is the best oil on the planet. I would argue that that and the rose oil from Living Libations Mm -hmm. are the best oils on the planet. This one in particular has it all. And it makes your skin look so dewy and beautiful. And at the same time, it's medicinal for it. 
therapeutic and it helps it. So I do that and then I put sun potion because I have very dry skin during the day. So I have to seal in my oil. I use sun potion. I melt it in my hands, their shea butter, and I put that as a sealant over. And then I, I guess I did lie. I do use sun potion. And then the third thing I do every single day because I'm doing that phyto retinol mm-hmm. is I do have to wear the sunblock on my face to protect that brand new skin. And for that, I use still, I've been using it for years and years as Suntegrity, just their regular Suntegrity one. So that's my skincare. Um, and we also have an essentials page, P.S., on the blog. Oh, yeah, with all these. Yeah, if you click. We'll have them in the show notes below, but we have an essentials page on the blog. You can check that out. And then I do have to tell everybody listening to this that I've tried almost every natural deodorant out there. I used to use Soap Walla is a fantastic one, but there's also this new one. Oh, what is it called? It's called, I can't remember all of a sudden, but I use their vanilla patchouli one. It's called Milk and Honey, I believe is the oh, brand. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It is the best deodorant. And then by far my favorite body oil on the planet is Jiva Poa. And I switch seasonally between, I use Sweetgrass during the summer and Mukti. And in the winter, I used 1967. The, they're the best body oils I've ever used. Yeah, and, I've had the pleasure of using them as, or I've received them as well and used them. And they're so, they just soften your skin the best. so much. I love them. And they're just so medicinal and spiritual. Like she uses this, you know, like, gongs and things when she's making them she Mm -hmm. practices medicine over them and they're the perfect blend between indigenous and ayurveda so that's the skincare wow yeah how do you grocery shop being such an intuitive eater in for example having food but also having options yeah this is a interesting one for me and i've had to find my balance so Mm -hmm. when i'm up at the retreat house in yosemite we have a csa that delivers through the fall to summer so not through winter because of freeze and luckily my intuitive eating it gets so into my circadian rhythm that I usually end up craving what's seasonal anyway right so I'll get this box and there's usually most of it I can apply to what I'm craving and then I'll obviously add in additions that I brought from LA you know and I, I actually do follow a lot to protein wise and bean wise mm-hmm. a lot of Elisa Vitti's program of cycle eating so I'll bring supplementary stuff knowing I'll be in my luteal phase for two weeks so I'll be eating this kind of protein yeah. and so that's what's going on up at the retreat house because there really aren't options to eat out up here you know and then when I'm in LA I have the luxury of living very close to a place called Cookbook and now into that's an echo park when I live there and now in Topinga there's a place called the Gourmet Cafe. And um, we have obviously the Wednesdays Santa Monica Farmer's Market. Mm -hmm. So I try to load up. And when I'm intuitively eating, I tend to crave, it's usually in sync with my cycle. I tend to crave certain foods for a week at a time, sometimes two weeks at a time. So when I'm in my ovulation phase and my hormones are balanced, I tend to be craving light watery foods and veggies. So it's like sauerkrauts and Mm -hmm. very, very watery veggies. So I'll load up on that at the farmer's market and bring it back. And there's many times that I'll stop at the store daily. We have Erwan, both in Palisades and, you know, Calabasas, that I'll pop over there and grab what I'm I'm wanting. And I do have to say, even from the day that I was so, so broke, it's the one thing I never, ever neglect. I like I have always spent all my money on on quality food. Always. Yeah. What about you, Lila? Yeah, I would say the same. I've become quite lazy when it comes to planning out what I'm going to eat. So I've kind of let my body just tell me what I want. And, you know, I used to be really into meal prepping, but then I would find myself, which I'm not knocking it. It definitely helped me a lot, but especially when I was in school and had a really busy schedule. But I find, you know, when I was doing that, I would find myself not wanting to eat what I had made the next, you know, few days, but forcing myself to do it just because I was like, well, I can't waste it. So now I usually just make sure I have a bunch of, you know, whatever I'm kind of feeling the moment, definitely seasonally. So now in the summer, I'm craving just like fruit and raw, green, watery veggies. So a lot of cucumber and celery. And I just have a bunch of raw ingredients in my fridge. And Sometimes a meal is I make a big salad out of it all. And I have this really yummy primal kitchen has a really good it's like a lemon turmeric dressing. We'll link so it. good. Yeah. So I literally would just have like a bunch of veggies and that on top of it. And then I'll put like avocado or, or some protein if I'm craving protein. But 
sometimes a meal is just like a bunch of celery sticks and like some crackers and a, some hummus if I'm craving that or or it's just like cantaloupe and peaches. So I really just let myself kind of feel my body tell me what I want and then I'll feed it. So I usually just I have a bunch of basics in my fridge. And if I'm really craving something that I don't own, then I'll allow myself to go get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's a great yeah. idea. I know for some people, obviously, you don't have that access to mm -hmm. an air one or whatever. Right. But I think great alternatives. I personally haven't used it, but I was totally floored the other day listening to an ad on Jenna Kushner's Gold Digger podcast. What a Thrive Market. Oh, yeah. Thrive like there's is awesome. so much accessible stuff on there oh, if you're yeah. ordering and they use completely zero waste packaging. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's like uh, half price, not half price, but it's discounted. It's all discounted. Primal, that's where I actually first tried my or got my dressing. Oh, <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, yeah Thrive so. is awesome for that. Here's a question for both of us. How often do I hang out with Max and how, for you, Lila, how to be happy while you're single? So I'll shoot off with Max. Sure. Max and I go through ebbs and flows. <laughs> <laughs> and we, our relationship is always ebbing and flowing. And we actually are so autonomous that we hang out more often than not apart. And when we are together, especially now that we've manifested this house in Topanga, we'll be spending more time together. But Max is really good at self-care. So he'll go to his meetings, I think, three nights a week. And that those are the nights that I schedule to hang out with my friends. So in actuality, we probably end up hanging out three nights a week a little bit and it's pretty boring stuff we it's like we get together to binge tv shows and have a dinner <laughs> sounds like my ideal relationship <laughs> i know it's like the dream and then the rest of the time i love being on my own being autonomous channeling being up at the retreat house i love aloneness more than anything and that's why max and i are so compatible because he's a workaholic and loves the community of aa so we uh it works well for us that we're we're Virgo Aquarius. We love a lot of alone time. So mm -hmm. it's not as much as you would think, although he does FaceTime me all day. <laughs> <And> I'm <laughs> like, I'm working. Stop FaceTiming me. Aww. So yeah. And I'll take it over to you, Lila. How to be happy single. Sure. So I have always been more of an independent person and enjoyed my time alone. That hasn't been a, a huge problem for me, but I don't know. I find that I've I'm now reframing time alone. You know, sometimes it goes on for I'm single for a little longer than I'd want to be, but I'm reframing that to be, you know, I'm so lucky to have this time alone to myself. I can be completely selfish. I can go where I want to go and not have to account for someone else. So really just reframing it as just, you know, freedom and and just treating myself to things. One of my favorite things to do is go out to eat by myself. Mm. So I'll do that. I, you know, have been able to, you know, since I've moved to neighborhoods in LA, I've actually been meeting new people and been able to just go to shows. And I don't know, I just, I kind of, I guess it's like the corny date yourself, but I do find that that's true for me. Like I, I'll find books to read or, I don't know, I've really, I've really been enjoying my time single. And I guess it's just because I'm, I'm just treating myself. So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops in everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the Pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways, creating the new ones. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, -E 
to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, expanded, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. The grass is truly always greener. Yeah, of course. I can remember when I went through my single stint, I think it was two years, and I remember starting to like dream of having the relationship just to have somebody to Netflix and chill with, right. like literally. <laughs> but I even told Lila, I think we had this conversation two days ago, a day ago, that if I weren't with Max, I'd be living in Scotland all year, you mm-hmm. know? And it's like, you do have a lot of compromises in a relationship because- he wouldn't let you like it would be so hard for him. Right, right. <laughs> I live in, I'm like, we're gonna do real long yeah. distance now. <laughs> Seriously. And I'm taking the dogs. Yeah. Um so it's just like I think it's so about owning who you are entirely mm-hmm. and, and dating yourself, which can be hard. And partnerships are great, I think, workshop for this because mm-hmm. the triggers that are coming up, or I'm sorry, it's now called unblock love. The triggers that are coming up for you about being single, you don't want to lose that energy. You want to work at peeling that onion right, layer. Right, absolutely. And blocking it, and that's going to help mm-hmm. fill that space earlier. Faster. Yeah, absolutely. And the times when I do get, you know, impatient or anxious or feel really lonely, I try to to catch myself and think, like, what is it that I'm truly missing in this moment? Or, like, what is it that I'm truly craving? And usually it's just, like, I really want to have a new experience, and I... I just imagine that it would be so like if I had a partner to have that experience with, it would be 10 times greater. But I'm like, you know what? I can just call up a friend and go to this restaurant or. Mary Gold. (laughs) Mary Gold is so in love with Lila. She's she's just been stalking Lila and doing things like using her paws to like walk on Lila's head. I mean, she's nuts. So she's right here. We're trying to record and she's at the window. So like, Lila, let me come. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and there is a tiny question somebody asked what type of dog is she oh, she's yeah. a mini australian shepherd we think a toy and maybe mixed with something else but she seems <laughs> she's also been a shit this whole time yeah, that she's... we've been up here she's i think much more puppy than they think i mean oh, she's absolutely chewed up a whole bundle of incense she's yep. been chewing on the borge morgan <laughs> chair that's like a collector's <laughs> item here so Mary, she ate a bag of raisins she yeah. got to somehow. I mean, she's like sniffing out something right now. We did manifest her. I will say that, that Max, Max's mom got one and Max fell so in love with this dog and he wanted to get, you know, and I was like, we were not getting a breeded puppy. <laughs> I, I refuse, you know, and. So we started the manifestation process, but I will speak to when you become, you have a very strong trust muscle and you've been manifesting for a long time. No list is really needed at Mm -hmm. that point. I do suggest it if you're specific in the beginning, but I just kind of threw it out there and I'm like, oh, the one will come. And then I got this crazy ping for two weeks. It was like, I need a dog. I need a dog. I've got to get a new dog. And so I kept looking and looking and sending Max all these things. And it's very hard to come by many Australian Shepherds toys. And the day I had my Goop talk, which also became a podcast episode, if you haven't listened to me on Goop, you should check that out. That very day, 20 minutes before I left, I found her at a Downey Kill Shelter and I said, Max, go now because they had her under a terrier, you know. And so if they had been if she had been under an Australian, she would have gotten swiped up right away. And he went and he fell in love with her. Her udders were still like full of milk because they had been breeding her. And we had to leave to go to Texas that week. So Lila and our other friend, Shannon, who's mm-hmm. also helped out the brand before, were like angels enough to go <laughs> and get in. her yeah. yeah, from the shelter after getting fixed because they wouldn't hold her for mm-hmm. us. So that's Mary Gold's journey. And a funny note while I was actually looking for the question <laughs> is that if anybody's seen that horrible movie Mustang, it's not horrible. It's actually beautiful, but it's very like Hollywood called Mustang. And it's it's about the prison system that and it's actually true. My dad's friend helps with this. They collect Mustangs in Nevada and then they have this program with the prison that they help to break them and train the horses so that the horses, you know, don't get euthanized and can go to work or be pets or whatever. But I always like to make fun of Max. I'm like, you would marry Gold or like that movie must because <laughs> it's like the the baddest prisoner yes. meets like the most emotionally unavailable horse. It's and then so they funny. fall in love. And Aww. that's Max and Marigold. Yeah. 
They're quite attached. Very. <laughs> Did you have a bridge or casual job when starting TBM? Oh, so I talk about it a lot. I think I've talked about this a lot, so I'll keep it short. But basically, I left my really toxic teaching environment where I got very sick as well. And I said, universe, show me. I only have $4,000 in savings and three months of unemployment. Show me what to do. Kept hearing people say, have you seen this blog, My New Roots? And and I went and looked at it and I was like, oh, you want me to start a blog? Okay, I'll do it. And it was a holistic blog. It wasn't, you know, food-based like My New Roots specifically. And from there, I didn't know what to do. So I did a ton of bridge jobs. I said I would never work for another person again, but I would take clients. So I became a freelance social media person. And I worked with Moon Juice when it was just starting its, its social media game. I don't think I was super instrumental because <laughs> I wasn't a great <laughs> freelancer. So I did that. And simultaneously, I was going to herbalism school. And I then began to take clients for that. And that was going fine, but it all both weren't an accumulation of things that were my passion. I found when you're working with people, when it comes to dietary or herbalism, mm -hmm. you can lead the horse to the water, but people have to drink, you know? And so I then had a friend reach out and say that her two friends, one was the head of ABC, were looking for a holistic chef. And I said, I've been thinking about doing that. And so I became a holistic chef to them and, and a few other clients. And that's when, uh, not long after, I started to get the download. You've got to put manifestation out there. Mm -hmm. And not only did I have shadow, I also had a little bit of that backlash from leading the horse to the water, but people not drinking. Right. Little did I know, when it comes to wanting things on the material plane, people will work really <laughs> fucking hard. Very motivated. That. Yes. <laughs> Very motivated. <laughs> so that's been tremendously successful. But yes, I created a lot of portals. I had one bridge job and then I began to create portals, which was the chefing and the herbalism. So mm -hmm. anybody who's done how to manifest money, formerly opulence, those were what my portals look like at the time. And then once this company began to make money, very little money before the manifestation, I was also opening portals of sponsorships and doing affiliate links, which we do very, very little of mm -hmm. now. Affiliates. Yeah. But only we all, and I only did then things I believe in, but now it's like, very sparse. I mean, because right. we're just lazy and we don't want right. to do it. And <laughs> if if a company comes around like Blue Blocks mm -hmm. did, and I was like, holy shit, everybody needs to have these and be doing this. We'll link them below Blue Blocks classes. And in fact, I think we have a code manifest and you get, I think, 50% off. Mm -hmm. But I wear them every day. I believe in them so wholeheartedly. We have a whole podcast episode dedicated to it with the founder that talks about why it is so important to protect ourselves from blue light. When that comes around, then I'll work with somebody. So that was another example of a portal. Cool. What about, let's talk about, somebody asks for the newbies, where did you grow up? We'll do, where did we grow up? I'll let sure. you kick that off, Lila. So I was born in Santa Monica, California, and lived there until I was 10. And then when I was 10, my family moved to upstate New York. So I went from city to small town. Up, I say upstate New York. People are like, oh, we're in New York. And I say Syracuse. They're like, oh, that's. <laughs> so, like Canada. Yeah, exactly. No, so I guess it's like central New York technically, but I just say upstate. So a small town right outside of Syracuse called Casanovia, which is like this really quaint, small upstate farm country town. There's a really beautiful lake and one little main street and a, you know, classic diner and subway and gas station. <laughs> but it was really, it was really beautiful. My family, we bought, or <laughs> my parents bought a old farmhouse from the 1800s. So it was on the historical register and it had 29 acres. So being a kid there was, was really fun, even though I had some resentment towards my parents for moving me from California. And I, harbored that for a while but it was a really beautiful upbringing because we had a creek in the backyard my friends and I would go out to the creek it kind of split our field in half so we'd go through it was a hay field so we'd go through the hay and get to this little creek and my parents would let us like sit out there for hours my friend and I would create a little bonfire and we would boil the water make pasta with the creek water and then put like a bunch of random shit in it and eat it which <laughs> I don't know how 
how we survived that. <laughs> like you should have put a few drops of iodine. Yeah, or whatever. yeah, maybe. But you but boiled. Yeah, I guess we boiled it. Yeah. I don't. My parents were just like, "Yeah, go for it." Rye kids. Rye kids. You yeah. should talk about that a little bit, like, yeah. like growing up rye. Sure. So yeah. So I don't know if you're if you're not familiar with rye parenting. It'll there's a link below in the show notes. But it's a form of parenting that's really focuses around respecting your child as as their own individual and you know it's really about fostering independence creating boundaries without you know because children really need boundaries but the boundaries come from respect and trust and so it's a lot of allowing your your kid to kind of be their own person and and follow their own desires and just be there to support that so my parents were pretty hands off in that way I also went to Waldorf school in kindergarten which is very it's just focused on like on imagination and just allows you kind of to learn on your own. And so I grew up with a lot of that. My dad being a writer, we just it was a lot of just like arty, do whatever you want. Note we weren't allowed to watch TV. And in the summer, my mom would actually she didn't do this every summer, but one summer she or a few summers, she actually killed our cable. Awesome. <laughs> so, but this is when we moved to upstate New York and my grandparents lived like a mile away from us. So we would just all go to my grandparents' house and say, watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, can we go to grandma's? But yeah, I remember that. But it was really, it was really nice. And I was really grateful for that. We had um, barns. We didn't have any, an- well, we had two pet sheep, hmm. Louie and Michelle. And what? How did you guys come yeah. up with that? That's so <laughs> random. <laughs> well, because the farmer who m- hid our fields or rented out the fields for hay, he had this really small little dairy farm that I would used to I used to go to when I was little and I remember he was like when you're 14 you can work for me and I was like can't wait to be 14 because <laughs> I would just run around the barn and play with the little calves and feed the Aww. calves and the barn kittens Did it you was ever so milk much fun any of the cows he showed me how to once yeah. but I didn't continue <laughs> um, but I, I actually saw a calf be born which was really cool. But anyways, he had like, he had these, t- somehow came across these two lambs and didn't want them. So he's like, do you guys want lambs? We're like, sure. So we had two, <gasps> two little sheep oh. and I named the boy Louie and I wanted the other one to be Lily, but my sister named her Michelle, which I think Meg? better fitter. No, Joanna. Joanna. <laughs> yeah. There's four of them. There. Yeah. Lila has three siblings. Yeah. But it was funny. My friend Shelby and I would walk the sheep literally on a leash around town until they literally, went, if they didn't want to move anymore, they would just sit and I'd have to call my mom. <laughs> to pick you guys <laughs> pick up, up with a trailer? With our van and we'd like put the seats back. <laughs> so funny, but actually really, really funny. I'm going off on a tangent, but a few, like two or three years ago, Shelby sent me a picture. I guess, I don't think it was on Instagram or it was on Facebook, someone posted from the town talking about like, you know, it being a farm town and they made some reference to like when they moved there, they saw two girls walking sheep in town. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, that was us. <laughs> so, so yeah, great. It was so funny. We had, there was a local restaurant that kept their pigs at our house to later slaughter, which did not go over well with my sisters because we had them from when they were piglets. <gasps> so hard. Yeah, so that only lasted like once and then <laughs> it was too much. So traumatic. Yeah. We had barn cats. My friend and I found baby kittens once and so we fostered them and yeah, it was a lot of like animals and running around outside and it's amazing. It was really nice. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, for those that don't know, I grew up where the retreat house is in the same county, and I grew up in a place called Cathay's Valley. So it was a ranch, and I was raised by the hillbilly parenting technique. <laughs> That'll be linked in the show notes. Yeah. Well, I'm kidding. <laughs> Here's a coke. So, yeah. like, go run around. <laughs> it was basically like, you're thirsty. We don't have water. Here's some yeah. Coors Light. My dad, I remember him like giving us tobacco for the first time. Oh. I mean, real hillbilly. <laughs> But uh, country, you know, it's funny, though, I have to say in the city, we're so sensitive with our children. Mm -hmm. And I got to see this dichotomy because quite a few of my girlfriends were up here at the retreat house with their babies. And then I had a guy who was coming over who had to cut down the dead cedars here and he was coming to quote it. And he had like his dog in the truck, the back of the bed and his two kids. I think one was three and one was six. And and, you know, country kids are such a different thing. I was a country <laughs> oh, kid. Yeah. You're so strong. You're so independent. Mm-hmm. You're tough. 
you know, it's, you're not coddled. You, you never can, wore shoes or clothes. No, yeah. you can handle everything. And so it was so funny to watch this juxtaposition that one of the kids was in the truck still and my friend was really concerned. And then they all came running out. They're like, dad, can I come at you? know, they're like nuts, <laughs> these country kids. And I, they're like in their Wranglers yeah. and boots, That's you know, so and funny. one's kind of sick. And then all the moms in LA are like trying to keep their kids away from the sick. <laughs> it was just fascinating to watch. <laughs> so I definitely grew up as a country kid and, um, like riding horse bareback and almost dying a few times horse riding. <laughs> but yeah, it was just a really country upbringing. And when I wasn't living here, I was living half the time in Modesto, California with my mom before she relocated up here. But that was where we grew up. And then where we picked the retreat house is uh, much more in alignment with Yosemite. So it's actually an hour away from our ranch. And it's just, it's a really special space that's surrounded by the cedars and shade and the summers up here where I grew up specifically in Cathay's Valley can be around 110 with a few oak trees to shade you. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> and I was like, there's just no way I can live in that. It's like death to me. So I ended up getting a much higher climate that stays a lot cooler and you have all of these, these trees. Yeah, it's definitely, it's like 10 degrees cooler up at the retreat or the forest retreat house than, than even it town. is. Yeah, than town. Yeah. How did you broach the subject with your mom that you were about to speak honestly? Oh, my mom and I are so open. She is like a Libra sun, Aries moon. So, <laughs> and she's a highly, highly self-aware alcoholic. So like my mom's since day one been like, I'm an alcoholic. You know, she's, there's no, I'm sure it's a little tough for her to sometimes hear some things, but she's also highly intuitive. I mean, she has every gift on the planet from mediumship to all of that. So she's also, I think, able to discern when you're sitting and talking with her, she'll be like, I, yeah, I have these gifts, but I'm also a drunk. So it's, you know, so she's like very, very mm -hmm. self-aware. And I warn her, you know, like before she does the workshops, I'm like, who knows what you're going to hear about yourself? Cause I'm really honest and open, but we're just, they often say in astrology, when your chart is mostly air and fire, you're a totally open book. When it's earth and water, you're usually incredibly private. And so my whole family, my dad is an Aquarius as well. We're all, he though has a lot of earth in his chart. We're all pretty open and loud mm -hmm. and um, outspoken. So with her, there hasn't been a lot. And I think when you're the child of an alcoholic, I learned in Al-Anon and many things I've done. I don't ask for permission anymore either. It's like, well, you did it. Yeah. So I get to talk about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm a public figure mm -hmm. and I'm going to, and I try to do it as respectfully as possible as well. I try not to share the things that are very shameful for her, but yeah, we never really had a conversation. Uh, I think a lot of people who have grown up maybe in an Irish and many cultures, Irish family, you don't communicate a lot. So <laughs> having an open, honest communication about mm -hmm. it wasn't ever in the cards because we don't really do that. And yeah. Yeah, there was never a big talking point, just a lot of warnings. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to that if you don't want to hear about yourself. Yeah. That's kind of it. I mean, Lila, you, you've opened up with your mom a lot lately. How does that look for you guys that are a little bit more normal? <laughs> sure. Well, she doesn't listen to these, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> good. <laughs> she, she'll like say, she'll be like, oh, I saw, I saw another podcast episode came out as if like that she saw that it was released as as if that's like she listened to it. But <laughs> she may, she, it's she, almost better. It, yeah, it is. I, I prefer. And if she's listening, I'm sorry, <laughs> mom. But yeah, it's, I've always been, I mean, I, I was pretty private, I guess, for a while, but the, I'm really comfortable speaking about anything at this point. And, and you identify, like Danny said, mostly as an Aquarius, more of an Aquarius yeah, than anything. Yeah, absolutely. Way more as an Aquarius. And although like all my plans are in Capricorn. <laughs> So, <laughs> so she's efficient. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but a dreamer. Yeah, but definitely a dreamer. And yeah, I don't know. I think it got to the point where I feel like, I guess the the reason why I like to be so open about things is that I ho always hope that my journey or a little bit of my life can resonate with someone else or be helpful for someone else. So when I think of like my relationship with my mom and we've had our ups and downs, and I've been able to speak more and more candidly with her about things that have bothered me. And I found that that's just, it, it was really uncomfortable for me at first. 
to be that open with her. But I realized the reason why I was keeping so many things from her was just out of out of anger and holding a grudge against her, thinking that like keeping that distance was punishment for her. But in reality, it was just kind of harmful for me because I remember there were times where I'd want to call her about something, but then I'd be like, oh, but I don't want to tell her. And so I found like really getting to the sort of the root of why I would have been less open and then digging that up and then just owning it. But I, yeah, I, I like being honest about things and talking about things. And yeah. I think that's why Lila, you know, it was so effortless for you to come be a part of this podcast Mm -hmm. for now is that you like to help people. Like you like to use, like I do your experiences and stories Mm -hmm. to help expand people. Yeah. I think that's really notable. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I mean, you had a discovery recently. I think it was what you were just speaking to. Mm -hmm. But maybe you want to talk a little bit, too, about your commitment. I mean, we've talked about it in support. Sure. (laughs) But this whole new commitment. Yeah. Epiphany in a nutshell. Yeah, absolutely. So I had an epiphany a few days ago, right at the end of the eclipse season and right when Danny Beinstein had told me that it was the midpoint or the kind of premature from from preliminary whatever and danny beinstein for anybody listening we have two episodes with her we'll link we'll link her in the show notes but go back and listen to those if you're remotely Mm -hmm. curious about astrology anytime i'm like really conflicted or stressed i just call her (laughs) (laughs) same she's on speed dial for me (laughs) but anyways she told me that you know this is the time where i'm going through my pluto transit which you can read more about but i was going through my pluto transit and so it's like this huge internal transformation and all about how I value myself and identify myself and et cetera, et cetera. So apparently this is all going to come to an end in the beginning of 2020. But right now is kind of the point where it's like I'm making a huge step towards whatever that that end is going to be. So I just found that to be fascinating since this all came together right at that time. But anyways, I had a an epiphany that, you know, a lot of people I do, you know, commitment issues are pretty popular or not popular, but a pretty common issue and, um, or, or block for many people. And I found that I was having serious commitment issues and I'm so indecisive. And it was, it's not just, you know, relationship commitment issues, but it's like commitment to what I'd order for lunch or what I'd, what shirt I'd buy. I'd always like end up buying, returning, and then being like, oh wait, shouldn't I, should I not have returned it? Just like constant indecision, which was making me feel you know, ironically, I was so indecisive and scared to commit to anything because I'm so afraid of being stuck or losing my freedom. But ironically, by not making any decisions and not committing to anything, I was so stuck in this limbo. And I had no freedom, really, because, you know, I'd be really interested in exploring something, but then I'd be like, I don't know if I want to do that. And then I just was, and I know that's part MG, but I just wasn't balanced in it. And it was really, I don't know, it was just halting me from growing it felt like so finally I had this all this epiphany it all came together one morning just like crashed down on me and luckily I had therapy right after or like an hour after that came through so I talked it out with my therapist and she was really helpful actually in in guiding me to see like the root of it and then kind of showing me examples as to maybe why I was having these issues and relating back to times where like decisions were made for me and I was unhappy and then times where I had made a decision and then not been so happy with it and just like helping me reframe all these things. So yeah, so now moving forward, my new commitment to myself is to commit to every decision I make and understand that making a decision doesn't mean that I'm locked into whatever I've decided upon. It just means that now I can move forward and allow and open my door more and more so that more things can come through. I love that. Yeah, It's such a great epiphany. And I think we all struggle with committing for the most part, or yeah. fearing that it will trap us, limit us. I, I just think that commitment mm-hmm. gives us a lot more freedom. Yeah. It's really great. And it's been so much fun because now it's like a game. I can't, I'm like, don't let myself <laughs> be, you know, second guess things. I'm just like, you know what? No, I ordered a sandwich for lunch. I'm not going to wish I got like the salad or I'm not going <laughs> to wonder if I got the burger, what that would have been like. You know? Milkshake. Yeah, the milkshake. Yeah, right. I'm just going <laughs> to commit to everything. And it's been, it's been really freeing so far. I like this last question. I think it's actually, we have many more and we can always do another episode of this, but I think this is a great question to end on because I tend to find myself curious about this, about people I'm expanded Mm -hmm. by. So somebody asked, can you guys read off your chart? And so I pulled up mine on Cafe Astrology. I'll go ahead. That's where I find mine. Other people use Astro something, but I'll go through mine really quick and just tell you in a nutshell what I am. 
and then Lila will let you go. So for those who don't understand astrology, again, go back to Danny Beinstein <laughs> or tune out if you don't care about astrology, but I'll, I'll give you my chart really quick in a nutshell. My son's Aquarius, Moon Capricorn, Mercury's Aquarius, Venus Aries, Mars Aries, Jupiter Aquarius, Saturn Scorpio, Uranus is Sag, Neptune Capricorn, Pluto Scorpio, Lilith Aries, North Node Taurus, which is what I think I'm very strongly in right now because I'm so <laughs> with the houses and things. My rising first house is Leo, second house Virgo, third Libra. Obviously, this is very simple for people who understand astrology. They just go in order. So if you know your first house is Leo, it's going to be the following planets after, but I'll read them off. So first is Leo, second Virgo, third Libra, fourth house is Scorpio, fifth is Sag, six is Capricorn, and then seventh Aquarius, eighth Pisces, ninth Aries, and then... 10th is Taurus, 11th Gemini, and then of course 12th Cancer. My sun is in my uh, seventh house. Moon is in my fifth house, Mercury seventh. Venus is in my ninth. Mars is in my ninth. That's what makes me a very good manifester, both of those. Uh, Jupiter is in my sixth. Saturn's in my fourth. Uranus in my fifth. Neptune fifth. Pluto's in my third. Lilith is in my ninth, and then my north node, Torin, is in the tenth. So that is mine. What I can say about my chart, though, I, somebody who asked this said it was really fun to, to find, you know, like, you're a Venus in Aries, like I am. Yeah, the Venus and Mars in Aries. I remember my very first reading with Danny Beinstein before I had launched this manifestation. She was like, you're an incredible manifester because of those. And I said, no, Danny, I really am. <laughs> I don't think she knew what I meant. I was like, no, Danny, I, I know how to manifest anything. Uh, you know, and she probably hears things like that a lot. The Mercury Aquarius makes it very hard for me to communicate properly. I don't communicate very easily or well. That's tricky. But the moon in Capricorn gives me my business sense. And certainly the moon in Capricorn, along with my north node of Taurin, makes me into my it's actually really funny we should have an episode with danny where we look at our authentic code meets oh, our astrology that's such chart. a good idea that's so interesting because those two things make up my whole thing of luxury that's one of my authentic codes mm -hmm. you know and so it'd be really fun to go through that but lila i'll let you read off what you are sure i just grabbed it off of um costar oh nice so it's a little less involved but my rising sign is sagittarius which I, I do really resonate with my chart, I believe. But anyway, so my rising sign is Sagittarius. My m sun is in Capricorn and my moon is in Aquarius. But then also my Mars, my Neptune, my Venus, my Uranus, my and my Mercury are all in Capricorn. Shit. Yeah, so ah. that's earthy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I have my Saturn in Aquarius and along with my moon. And that's in my third house. Oh, and I should note that my moon is also in my second house, mm. along with all my signs in Capricorn. Oh, my God. Yeah, so that's ah. all, like, personal value and identification. <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> so that's well, that's why it's, it's a lot. Danny's like, wow, I've never seen this many planets <laughs> in one house. And then my Scorpio is, or my Jupiter is in Scorpio in my 11th house, and my Pluto is in Scorpio in my 12th house. So there you have it. Yeah. That is us. Now you can go and like decipher. Exactly. What we're, what <laughs> we're about. Find out our deepest, darkest. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for a year. And mm -hmm. I do want to say, I mean, I've simmered on if we should go through a tiny season where we replay the most important episodes mm -hmm. for me um, in terms of who I've spoken with. But if you're just joining us now, please go back. Some highlight episodes you absolutely have to listen to are both of Jenna, Zoe, oh, yeah. human design episodes. Absolutely. You need to listen to both of Danny Beinstein's astrology mm -hmm. episodes. Nadine Artemis is a very important one. Maggie Harson, who Kai is incredibly important. It's how she healed herself entirely of every autoimmune you can basically name just through nature. So those are some big highlights. There's plenty more, but do go back. Don't just tune into the latest because there are some great ones. And we hope to bring you another great year of content. Mm -hmm. so, so exciting. And if there's anything you'd like us to talk about or 
any guests you want to know about, please post about them in the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. We're definitely starting to get this next season going. Yeah, Figuring absolutely. it all out, I guess. So see you next week. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, we did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this, you'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the WISE, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week. <laughs>